Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first webinar with Bouchard Vassland North America and La Motavier. My name is Eglantine Chauffour. I will be uh, your speaker today, and I'm the product manager of winemaking solutions at Bouchard Vassland, taking care uh, of the market of La Motavier in USA. So now I'm going to stop um, the video so you can actually focus on the presentation and we are going to start um, talking about SO2 alternative for microbial control in winemaking. So before actually starting, I would like to introduce you to two, uh, the two brands that are partnering for this webinar. So Bucher Vasselin, designer, manufacturer and seller of material for grape and wine processing since 1856, so 162 years of history, experience, knowledge, innovation all around the world. Boucher Vassin is pretty well known, so I'm pretty sure everybody already heard about them. La Motabier, French wine making product brand, um, very well known for their high quality product. So they are collaborating with most of the uh, premium wineries in Bordeaux. It has been founded in 1878, so new in USA, but 140 years of expertise, development, and uh, technical support in other countries. We are now making it available for you in USA. So about the webinar basics, um, 30 to 35 minutes presentation, 10 minutes Q&A. Please keep your question for the end. So at the Q&A, I will open the Q&A section and you can write everything, you, every question you have there uh, related to the topic of the webinar and I will do my best to answer them. Uh, for any connectivity issue, please uh, go on the website of zoom.us or click on this link. So let's talk about um, reducing sulfur. Why are we talking about this topic? today. Why is it a hot topic? So first reason is usually because the consumer concern is increasing. People want more and more organic products. The media blamed the headache due to the wine on sulfur, which is not completely true, but um, that's what people think. And then it is actually sulfur is a strong allergen and toxic uh, for human health when it becomes high quantities. As sulfur is present in most of the um, processed food around us, wine just is adding to this limit. So it can actually become pretty toxic at one point. Then we have to label, uh, to label contain sulfides in our wine, in our bottle, when uh, sulfur, total sulfur is higher than 10 milligrams per liter. In terms of technical aspects, sulfur can act as a solvent or uh, extraction, which can be good or bad. Um, it extracts all the phenolics from grape, but you can extract as well the protein, uh, which sometimes you don't want. So it can inactivate thiamine, which is an essential vitamin for the yeast. Without thiamine, yeast will have um, more risk to not complete the fermentation and will produce more compounds that can bind with sulfur later on the, down the road. Sulfur will bleach color, so it's gonna bind with the free anthocyanin that has a nice red flashy color uh, and make it transparent. Sulfur can actually favor uh, the synthesis of H2S by yeast and sulfur can flavor, favor uh, other of aromas by lowering down the potential, the redox potential. On the other aspect of technical, it happens that sulfur is actually not the best antimicrobial we can use in winemaking, as only molecular sulfur will have an antimicrobial effect. As you can see in this table, only SO2, not charged sulfur in wine, will have an antimicrobial effect. What happens is, in fact, SO2 not charge can actually go through the membrane of the cells once they are in the cell, in the yeast of bacteria cells, the pH is six, so sulfur gets dissociated and become SO3 
two minus, so sulfide. This compound is highly charged and will start to bind with any um, enzyme that are active in the metabolism of the cell. So in this case, sulfur SO2, once in the cell, inhibit all the metabolism and inhibit the cells. So that's why molecular sulfur is um, antimicrobial. Molecular sulfur is depending on pH, as you can see in this graph here, and of free SO2, as you can see here. So while we increase the pH, we need more free SO2 to a 0.8 of milligram per liter of molecular sulfur, which is a number that can be considered as antimicrobial. This graph is as well showing you that basically in a red wine, if we take 3.8 of pH, we would need 80 of free sulfur to be protected as antimicrobial, which is a number that is completely insane, but doesn't make sense to age a wine at this amount of sulfur. We are going to talk about almost like a lot of total sulfur and maybe above the legal limit and as well a wine that smells only sulfur that has no development, nothing that moves, and no color. So this is actually not considerable. So sulfur in high pH wine is not a good option to um, control microbes. In a lower pH, if you look at here, for example, 3.2, we will need only 20 of free sulfur. So in this case, sulfur will work. The other point is that to have free sulfur, um, without increasing too much the total sulfur, we have to make sure we don't have too much bound. As you can see here, the bound sulfur has no action at all. Bound sulfur uh, is due to uh, some molecules that has been can be produced by yeast or bacteria, or even when there is botrytis present, that will bind to sulfur in a strong way and increase your total sulfur without letting have free sulfur. So these compounds can be acetaldehyde, pyruvic acid, oxoglutarate acid. Um, we are going to talk about how to reduce this compound to make sure we have, when we put sulfur, this sulfur, sulfur is efficient and can be used properly. So a sulfur, a sulfur that is a um, multitask um, wine additive is uh, going to be not so easy to replace. But with now innovation, we have some uh, good alternative, let's say. So for the extraction uh, role of sulfur, we can use maceration enzyme. For the antioxidant role of sulfur, we can use tannins or sulfur-containing pep peptides such as glutathione or cysteine and ascorbic acid. For the antioxidasic, we can use tannins or fining agents. And for the antiseptic, we can use microbial competition or ketosan. Obviously, for any of this role, sorting grapes can be a very big improvement already because you don't spread the contamination and you are actually selecting only the grapes that are perfect. Good hygiene and good winemaking wine -making practices are obviously uh, highly recommended. I will talk about um, extraction antioxidant and antioxidasic in another webinar. Today, we are focusing on the antiseptic role of sulfur. So first thing, uh, I want to show you the um, options about sorting grapes uh, to make sure you can keep integral grapes with higher quality without contamination. You eliminate the ones that are contaminated. If you want more information about um, these grapes, these sorting tools, please feel free to visit these two websites and feel free to ask us questions. Basically, you have sorting tables, um, but everybody knows sorting tables. You can have optical sorting. So Boucher has a Vistalis that can run up to 10 tons an hour. So optical sorting is extremely accurate, and you can basically remove everything you want to remove. So that's a very good option uh, when we are talking about limiting contamination and keeping only the integral ripe grapes. And then there is another um, type of sorting that exists, which is densimetric sorting. So Boucher developed the densilis that we have available for trial uh, here in USA. Uh, densilis can actually wash 
the grapes, there is a concept of washing the grapes first, and then it's going to separate the grapes by density. So you will have one part that are uh, integral grapes with and ripe, and on the other part, the waste that will be unripe berries, open berries, and contaminated berries. So this system is a little bit slower, four to six ton, but you actually can really separate by maturity as well. So second approach in uh, way making product, so would be instead of using sulfur, you can actually use bioprotection. So I'm gonna focus on bioprotection today. And bioprotection is a natural way to inhibit unwanted microbial development and wine spoilage by mastering the colonization. So the idea is that you put your um, positive microbes or microbes that you know are gonna colonize but are not giving you any off flavors and you put them in the environment, they start to develop, they take over the bad one and they are inhibiting all the spoilage microbe to develop. So you are sure that this environment is colonized and by the right population. So this concept has been used in centuries and in a lot of different industries. Um, this concept is completely used in pharmaceutical industry, but as well, uh, if we stay in our uh, winemaking, like in, in all vineyard management or culture, culture uh, crops, uh, can be used. It's the most natural way to um, inhibit spoilage or avoid spoilage is to actually colonize the environment with a positive microbes. So the requirement for a good bioprotection uh, are a strong implantation, dominant population, no off flavor development, and in terms of winemaking, we are looking at no fermentation capa capacities since we want the saccharomyces to ferment. We don't want our bioprotective yeast to be the one that ferment and lead the fermentation as well. So we are looking at non-saccharomyces. So in this case, uh, Lamotta yeast start to focus on a Mechnikovia pulcherima, which is a yeast, the yeast strain, non-saccharomyces, and uh, decided to go with a pure product that is pure Mechnikovia pulcherima. So why Mechnikovia pulcherima, that you can call MP if you prefer? Um, because there is no fermentation capacities, so you can actually use it on grapes, uh, white and rosy grapes, and you will not have issue to settle your tank. There is a strong dominance and colonization, so that's good. It's taking over all the other microbes. There is a good aromatic impact, so very high beta-glucosidase activity in Mechnikovia pulcherima and ester production. So we are actually revealing uh, or expressing the varietal compounds present on the grapes. And one of the most important points is that Mechnikovia pulcherima is producing pulcherimin, which is a pigment, a red-orange pigment, as you can see in the picture here, uh, that has an antimicrobial effect. So this pulcherimin is produced by Mechnikovia, and this pulcherimin is going to become a toxin for all the other sporage microbes, which inhibit their development. So after a lot of work and studies with Stellenbosch and Bordeaux University, we selected uh, Excellence BioNature. So we selected a strength through um, its uh, fermentation kinetics, enzymatic potential, and production of off flavors uh, such as H2S, VA, and other uh, ethyl acetates, for example. And we didn't want any flows in the wine. So these were our criteria of selection. It happened that uh, Excellence BioNature, when I say no fermentation at all, it's gonna die after three to five percent of alcohol and then it resists to very low temperature so we can use it for cold soaking uh, so from 2 to 25 celsius much decovia pulcherima is going to be fine so here you can see some studies that has been uh, published on different strains of much decovia pulcherima and uh, their effect on the other uh, yeast spoilage yeast so as you can see here, 
none of the strains have an impact on saccharomyces and you can confirm it with this graph here where you see the saccharomyces development and population stay high while Mechnikovia is dying after a few days of fermentation as alcohol is increasing. But there is strong inhibition on the other spore age yeast that we can find in grapes. So we went with the strains 48, which has the strongest inhibition uh, properties against spore age yeast. Another thing I would like to show you about uh, the Excellence BioNature is actually its uh, viability, strong resistance um, to survive. So basically, this yeast can be applied, has to be applied as uh, early as possible. So on grapes, you can be applying it in the vineyard, you can be applying it at crushing, you can be applying it in the press or during filling the tank for cold soaking. The idea is that this yeast can be dissolved, rehydrated in um, ambient temperature water and left in this water for a good four hours without losing viability. But this yeast can actually put dry from the packet on the grapes or in the juice and will not lose viability either. So very easy to use product. And we are talking about a treatment at five grams per hectoliter. So I want to show you some trial results um, that I think can be important. So some uh, trials has been done on Cabernet Sauvignon. As you can see here, these are the trials we did. So one has sulfur, one has no sulfur and uh, um, Excellence DS as fermentive yeast. No sulfur with Excellence BioNature at five grams per hecto and a native fermentation. No sulfur, Excellence BioNature, five grams per hecto and DS. On the Chenin Blanc, we did only two different trials, one with sulfur, one without, and with only Excellence BioNature. So um, I'm not putting here the analysis because they were actually pretty uh, close to what we were expecting, which first, all the juice were the same, so it was very homogeneous um, dispatching of the trial. And then the more sulfur we add, the more sulfur we have to add, so we produce more combining compounds with sulfur. So the um, trial that has been having sulfur was higher in total sulfur as well. And then uh, it happened that our native fermentation in this trial here in the Cabernet uh, took much longer to ferment. So our native strains was probably not the best in this case. And we had more ethyl acetate, we had more VA, and we had more uh, acetic acid bacteria present. So I just want to share with you the result of the tasting, which I think at the end we are making wine to drink. So we want we are talking about the result of how the wine tastes. And so basically this is uh, speaking by itself. So you can see in red the modality with sulfur and in dark green the one with BioNature and commercial yeast DS. And you can see that when we use sulfur, we increase the fault, we decrease the appreciation, while if we do the BioNature and um, the DS commercial yeast, we are actually having almost no fault, we increase complexity, we increase cleanliness, general appreciation, balance, persistence, aromatic persistence, and roundness. Same result in the white wine in Chenin Blanc, where with the BioNature, we increase all the positive aromas, we increase the balance, acidity, and appreciation. Remember that BioNature has a strong uh, beta-glycosidase activity that will help expressing the aromas. So very positive results on uh, the trial we have been doing um, so far. So if I want to make a conclusion, so this would be the ID of the Excellence BioNature. So I told you, pure Metchnikovia pulcherima, low production of H2S or uh, VEA. Uh, this yeast does not produce um, precursor substrate for uh, Brettanomyces to produce volatile phenols. 
uh, there is a strong implantation. There is a very good viability during rehydration, so you can prepare your yeast before and then add it four hours after. Low fermentation capacity, it's gonna die between three and five percent of alcohol. No uh, ethyl acetate production, and then very good resistance to sulfur, to big range of temperature, and resistance to low pH too. So as a bioprotector, I think we fill um, all the requirements. We can manage the microflora at the first stage of remaking. So with uh, BioNature, the suppression of sulfur on grapes is actually possible. There is less uh, sulfur combining compounds produced when you use BioNature. Your wine end up more aromatic with a better mouthfeel and higher complexity. And this product, in addition to being non-allergenic, is actually organic certified. Um, and it's, so it's a great alternative to sulfur for microbial con control on grapes. In terms of application, we are talking about five grams per hectoliters on uh, healthy grapes. We can go up to 10 grams per hectoliters if the grapes are having uh, highly contamination, high contamination of botrytis, for example. So let's go now in the part of um, wine. Let's go now in the wine part. In wine, SO2 is used as antioxidant and antiseptic. So again, we're gonna focus on the antiseptic approach and the alternative could be microbial competition, again, of dominance of a microbe that we know is positive and ketosan. So something very important to know is that after alcoholic fermentation, we have a microbial open door. Every single microbes are a potential danger at this step. The environment is warm, there is nutrients, there is substrate, there is low competition, there is low protection. Any single microbes could start to take over and it would become uncontrolled, spoiled wine. So, we want to make sure we know which microbe is gonna develop. And for this, we have to inoculate with the compounds, with, with the microbe we want. So um, to do the malolactic fermentation, we highly recommend to inoculate, uh, and this can be considered as bioprotection because you are gonna control the microflora balance, no of aroma production, low biogenic amine production. You can ensure your malolactic fermentation completion you limit the risk of microbial spoilage and you will uh, control the production of this SO2 combining molecules. So we at La Matabie uh, propose uh, an O1, which is a strain that is actually resistant to very difficult condition. It's a strong fermenter with a short leg phase. It consumes acetaldehyde, so it consumes the compound that will bind with sulfur. So that's actually helping having your sulfur more active later down the road. And it does not produce biogenic amines, as you can see in this graph here, where we compare a wild, uh, spontaneous uh, malolactic fermentation that is not controlled. You don't know what to expect to an one. Biogenic amine production is a very important topic as uh, they are responsible of some very off flavor, such as rotten flesh, dead bodies, or even uh, fish pound, um, fish food flakes. And as well, they, some of them are regulated with some countries, such as in Switzerland and Canada. So inoculation is highly recommended. Then the second thing is uh, that you can use during aging. So this would be after malolactic fermentation uh, or after alcoholic fermentation if you don't do malolactic, is uh, ketosan. Ketosan is a great alternative to sulfur for microbial control, especially in high pH wine where sulfur doesn't work. So ketosan is a product of the deacetylation of ketin. And ketin is a polysaccharide that in winemaking is derived from Aspergillus niger. So it is a vegan non-allergenic product. Only the one extracted from Aspergillus niger is legal in US in uh, winemaking uh, use. 
So here you can see the molecule of the ketin. We do the deacetylation, and then when we put it in low pH, such as wine, the, the ketones then become highly charged and active. So how does it work? Uh, the ketosan, so the positive, positive charge of the ketosan, are gonna be attracted by the negative charge on the cell walls of the microbes. And as you can see in this picture, but this is a bread and this is a ketosan. Bretanomyces got trapped into the ketosan, so it's working as a magnet, but compounds get together, they stick together, then there is a lease of the cell, and then we end up with the death of the cell. Ketosan is um, most of the part of ketosan are uh, unsoluble, so they are going to be precipitating. And then you can do a rack off and eliminate the leaves that are the dead microbes and the ketosan. The ketosan of Lamotagi is called Kilbret, as you can see um, here. And it's a vegan allergen free alternative to sulfur as antimicrobial. So let me just show you. Um, uh, the range of activity of ketosan because even if we call it kill bread, it has actually much more application than just removing bretanomyces. Ketosan has a wide spectrum of activity as antimicrobial. It can remove uh, lactic acid bacteria, it can remove non-saccharomyces yeast, and it can remove some acetic acid bacteria as well. So if you look at this study here, you can see the different microbes that has been tested. This has been done in a laboratory, so the dosage that they came up uh, with are much higher than what you would need to do in a winery. But you can see that they tried different dosage to see the sensitivity of um, the microbes. And as you can look here, which is a summary of this table, basically with 20 grams per hectoliters from their dosage, which means five from our perspective, you can remove Bretanomyces, Anococcus, Lactobacillus, then something, and then with a little bit more, you can even remove Zygosaccharomyces bailey. Something that you want to notice here is that Saccharomyces is actually not uh, impacted by ketosan, so Kilbred could be even used during fermentation if there is uh, contamination bloom to remove Spoilage microbes and it will not interact with saccharomyces and fermentation because you will need more than 200 grams per hecto to inhibit saccharomyces. So the application of Kilbret, we could use it to control malolactic fermentation, but more, most likely you are gonna want to use it to control microbial spoilage during aging. So there is two approach on this. You can use it as a curative and if you look at uh, the table here, it shows you the dosage. So when we are talking about moderate um, contamination, so 100 cells per milliliter, two grams per hectoliter of kilbret will be enough to remove the cells. Higher contamination, 1,000 cells per milliliter, we are talking about four to six. And then when we go in very high contamination, so above 10,000 cells per milliliter, we are from six to eight. The legal limit of Kilbret is 10 grams per hectoliter uh, from the TTB, uh, which is more than enough to remove high contamination um, wine, high contaminated uh, wine. So you can see here how it works. You have the control with actually bread, and after four grams per hectoliter, there is no bread at all that can grow on the plate, and obviously with eight, even lower. Uh, the other approach can be preventive approach. So we are talking about a wine that we suspect has some issue, but uh, not really issue that we can measure. We just want to make sure it will not happen. So we will kill all the cells before they actually develop. And so in this case, we talk about lower dosage of kill bread, and you can put it in your barrel. You can stir your wine uh, and stir your barrel. Uh, this kilbret is going to be still active for four months after treatment. So in case you have a recontamination, we realize that four months after the, treat the initial treatment, um, bread or spoilage microbe don't develop. On the preventive side as well, we realize that when uh, treatment has been done, 
the residual bretanomyces don't produce volatile phenols. So um, ketosan somehow interact with the metabolism of bretanomyces. And um, even if the cell is not dead, the cell is not able to produce um, volatile phenol, which are the spoilage compounds due, uh, related to bread. And since Kilbret is a pure ketosan product, there is a, we are talking about very small dosage, so there is a very limited impact on the organolytic profile of the one. So this said, I would like to um, make a big conclusion. So I want to remind you that we talked about uh, microbial control and alternative to sulfur through the full process of uh, winemaking. So something very important is to limit the presence and the growth of spoilage microbes from harvest at the beginning. It's gonna be much easier to deal with it uh, if you remove it at the beginning. So you can eliminate all the contaminated grapes with a good sorting option. And then excellence by your nature, that is um, bioprotection alternative to sulfur organic uh, certified non-saccharomyces yeast. Then to control spoilage microbe and microbial deviation during fermentation, you want to inoculate with a strain that you know and you trust. So make sure you use a good commercial yeast and a good commercial malolactic bacteria. We are proposing an O1. Then after fermentation, after malolactic fermentation during aging, I would recommend to eliminate the gross leaves, which is where all the dead microbes are staying. And then uh, kill bread treatment in curative, if you don't have any contamination, if you do have contamination in preventive, if you don't have any contamination. If you do all this, you should not have bloom of spoilage microbe at um, aging and pre-bottling. So to summarize, this is the chain uh, that we would recommend for microbial control alternative to sulfur. Obviously, uh, added to this, you have to make sure that you can manage a very good hygiene uh, in the winery and in the cellar then you want to make sure you do a good routine analysis during aging. So please make sure you check regularly your VA and you check regularly um, the microbial load, so plating, and then you can taste. And um, this said, I think uh, these are my conclusion for today. So thank you very much. I'm gonna open now uh, the question and answer portion. Um, and I will do my best to answer all your questions. If you do have questions that comes later, feel free to email me in the email here, eglantine.chauffeur at bouchervasselin.com. You can visit our website. And then I just wanted to let you know that La Motabia has a very cool app uh, that is actually very useful uh, to help you and guide you taking decisions concerning yeast nutrition, malolactic fermentation management, how much sulfur to add, there is like all these conversion uh, tools, but as well which oak you want to choose and how you can restart stock fermentation. So thank you very much for your attention and now I will take your questions. So thank you.